Welcome. Welcome to our bite-sized canine anatomy. And in this session, we're going to look at the gluteals. And um, I'm just so overwhelmed by the positive emails and texts, um, calls, um, all the messages we've had since the last one. And I just want to say we're so grateful for receiving those. It drives us to keep going forward. And just to wish you all a really lovely sunny evening, wherever you are. Um, I know we've got some people from abroad, so we've got this huge global community and it's brilliant. So I'm just gonna bring up the first slide. There we go. I'm just uh, bringing up the first slide. There we go. Okay, fantastic. So just want to say welcome back to the people who come here regularly and have been signing in and using this bite-sized canine anatomy. And also a really warm welcome to all the new people coming. So to start off with, I just thought I'd do a little bit of orientation around the page if you've not participated in one of these live events before. So um, bottom right hand corner of your screen, if you're on a laptop, you'll see a chat box. Please do add your comments, give us feedback, share ideas and knowledge with each other. That's what it's there for. Um, don't put your questions in there though, because they'll get lost. And we want to make sure we answer all your questions if you've got them. So um, along the bottom navigation bar, halfway along is ask a question. That's where you can enter your question. So I don't want to miss any of your important questions. So please don't put them in the chat. And I think the only other thing to mention is the ask a question, you can upvote. So when you upvote, if you see a question you really like, you can vote for that. When I go in to ask a question, if you can just stop upvoting for that moment, because my screen is different to yours and I don't want to lose the question. So I think we're going to start. Um, I had a couple of emails and queries this week asking me what NHS stands for, because I've been in conversation with so many people this week from Australia, New Zealand, Thailand, Switzerland, Germany, Ireland, um, and just all over the UK. And I hadn't really appreciated that maybe everybody's not familiar what that stands for. So this is our national health service. But what we're doing is we're kind of incorporating all our emergency services in there. Our frontline who are really battling and putting themselves at risk to save and look after the people who've gone into hospital. And they're just doing the most amazing job. And I'm really humble um, to know so many of them. And so this is about celebrating people and people's stories. I know a few people, a few businesses have put the word in, crush the, um, the peak, but it's not about statistics. It's not about businesses. This is all about people and every person's story really matters. So this is our poster to say, follow what our UK government is saying. We've got another three weeks of lockdown. Um, and like Spain, the USA, France, Italy, um, the UK, unfortunately, you know, our death rate is really, really high and escalating. So this is such an important message for us globally. But I also wanted to bring a bit of joy into the poster. So I've got this wonderful terrier looking straight at you. And it's about showing connections, connections between therapists and their um, the dogs in their care, connections between people, owners and their dogs, connections between trainers and the dogs that they're working with. And these connections are so important and dogs bring us so much joy into our lives. So trying to focus on some positives here. So just going to move on to the first slide. I can still see people arriving and I'm sorry, I forgot to just say a big thank you to Sarah. She's in Cambridgeshire. I'm in Norfolk. Sarah is running the chat. I try not to glance at that, organize the text, speak and move a slide because it's really tricky for me. It's not my natural background. So thank you so much, Sarah. She's going to be supporting everybody. And just remember, if you're arriving, please put your questions and ask the question, not in the chat. But please share ideas, knowledge, you know, clinical tips. That's what it's all about. It's about sharing and being interactive in this amazing global canine community that we're building, which is fantastic. So we're going to have a look at the gluteal muscles. And these are located in the 
lateral pelvic muscles. So in the pelvis, there are two main muscle groups, the medial uh, muscle group, which we're going to look at in the next crowdcast, which has just gone live for you to book into. It's going to be on the hip joint. So the gluteals this time, then the hip joint next time kind of go together. It's a really good marriage. So they're located in the lateral lateral pelvic muscles they're innervated by the gluteal nerves we've got a cranial and caudal gluteal nerve and the components or the parts of this muscle um, mass that we're going to look at is going to be the middle gluteal the superficial gluteal and the deep gluteal now i know some of you may have different names for them so you may um call them slightly different names and that's fine there's no issue with that it kind of reflects when you learnt your anatomy what text you, you use. So I tend to go for the language that works for the people that I share information with. So there is a debate about piriformis and piriformis really excites the human practitioners who have then trained as veterinary physiotherapists. Um, and piriformis in the dog, it's really unusual because there's this huge debate. Is it part of the deep gluteal or is it a muscle in its own right? So it's just something to think about. So I just thought that we're going to get a bit orientated around the pelvis as we're going to spend some time this session and next session looking at it. And I've tried to color code it to make it a little easier for you. So we've got a pelvic girdle and that constitutes two hip bones. So the hip bone, you've got one for each pelvic limb, is also known as oscoxy. And basically it's four fused bones. It's the ilium, the ischium and the pubis and a really small acetabular bone. And so we need to have a think about the arrangement of the pelvis and its position, because it's really different to humans and really different to horses and cattle. So this is why we need really specific canine treatment techniques. What we may do on a human definitely isn't gonna work on a dog. And you want to hook into the biomechanical model because the dog has got four legs for two reasons, to support it against gravity, and to accelerate forward in the sagittal plane, to go forward in movement. And so the whole design, the biomechanical design of the, of the dog is to facilitate this. And so when we actually look at the overhead view, which is on the right, which I think is really important, you can see the hip bones are actually in the sagittal plane near enough, which is totally different to humans and totally different to, to horses. So knowing your canine biomechanical model is so important so you can draw upon the appropriate treatment techniques you're going to use. So really significant bony landmarks for us to orientate ourselves, and we'll do more of this on the hip joint, is gonna be that iliac crest. It's a C-shaped crest, it's huge. It's marked here with the um, bright blue arrows. There's two arrows on the left, and they're marking your tuba sacrali and your tuba coxi. And then the iliac crest is the bone between them. So it's the cranial border of the ilium, C-shaped, and it's your tuba sacrali and your tuba coxi, and that's marked by the blue bones. Now your tuba sacrali in the dog, we've got our cranial dorsal iliac spine, which is quite thick, much thicker than the ventral one. And we've also got our caudal dorsal iliac spine, which is underneath the um, arrow on the orange arrow. It's on the right hand side of that. So you can see that's laying on the, on the bone and then the bit of bone between it. So all of that is the tuba sacrali, okay? And it's quite thick. And the, um, I'd say the proximal half of the iliac crest is also thickened. So this is where it leads me to say, these are really useful bony landmarks to orientate yourself. It isn't appropriate in the dog to be palpating the tuba coxy. It's unpleasant, it's deep, it's narrow. If you're going to track up and follow the muscles that attach to there, whereas in the horse, you know, um, in people, in cattle, the tuba coxy is definitely something that's regularly palpated and used to analyze um, the sacral position. We've also got the um, ischiatic tuberosity. I call it the tuberisci. So again, that's in a pink line, that's a pink arrow in the left hand picture. And that's just to show you what an enormous knob it is. 
Um, and it's a huge knob, so something very significant is going to attach to it, and that will be the hamstring group of muscles. But we're looking at the gluteal muscles. So if you have a look at the ilium bone, you can see I've put gluteal surface of the ilium bone. It's giving us a massive clue. That's where the gluteals are going to arise from. And we've also, just to mark where the body of the ilium is, because that's really relevant. And then the greater trochanter, another huge landmark that's got the green arrows. And I've kind of put it into the bird's eye view of the pelvis and also to the lateral view. And then if you just look below that, there's a yellow arrow and that's the third trochanter. Now in the dog, the third trochanter is a really insignificant knob. It's not significant, it's not big, but it does have something attached to that. And really the bigger the knob, usually the more important the structure that is attaching to that. So just to get yourself orientated around the pelvis, I thought that might be useful. There's also a black line on the right hand picture and that is the sacrotuberous ligament. So it's sacro, comes from the sacrum, tuberous, goes to the tuberous ski. It's a hugely important stabilizing structure for the pelvis and it's very relevant because in the, in the horse, it's a sheet, whereas in the dog, it's a cord. It's very deeply placed. Um, and there's some really useful ways to palpate that with therapeutic handling, because especially in athletic dogs, particularly agility dogs, they very often can have an issue at one of the attachments. And that's something we can go through in our kind of new phase of things I'm going to share about. So just moving on to the next slide. So just give a shout. I don't know if Lynn's here in the live event, but I know she'll watch the replay if she hasn't made it. So Lynn from Essex asked me, can we do something about fascia? And we are really responsive to our feedback. So if you send us something, we're really interested to try and present that for you. So Lynn, hope you're listening, but this is a little bit of fascia. It's a fantastically important structure. In the pelvic limb, the fascia is divided into deep and superficial. And rather than thinking of it separate pieces, I want you to think of it as a bodysuit, a double bodysuit. OK, so it's continuous across the body. And the other thing, my favorite story for it, it's like the envelope around a letter. So it's really important as the envelope around the muscle, the fascial envelope around each muscle and between the muscles. Um, and it's it also houses nerves, um, uh, uh, blood vessels, um, lots of very important things. The deep fascia tends to be in this region, the deep fascia tends to be the thicker. And the other thing is it's in layers. So there's lots of layers, a little bit like shoe pastry. And in some places, or think of loads of envelopes together, you've got wet. In some places, it's stuck together. And in other places, it's quite loose. So understanding the fascial arrangement of the dog is really paramount if you're going to do manual therapies like massage therapy, myofascial releases, soft, soft tissue mobilization techniques, because by understanding the normal structure, we can then identify where it's tagged down or not functioning efficiently. So fascia is this continual coverage. And as it passes from one region to another, it tends to take on the name of that region. So um, it's very strong, it's connective tissue, it's very mobile, it makes retinaculum, it's intermuscular septor, it gives rise for muscles in aponeurosis. So it's an amazing structure that we have. So in the superficial regions here, we've got the superficial gluteal, the superficial caudal fascia and the lateral fascia of the thigh. So the superficial fascia of the trunk continues it's a continuous structure and it goes dorsally on the lumbar dorsal region and then it becomes a superficial gluteal fascia and the reason i'm making such a big thing about this is because the gluteals arise off this fascia so we need to know about that because what we do know is the insertion and origin of a muscle and its attachments is where it has the greatest force and the greatest pull so this is where we're going to find our muscle injuries and that's a really top clinical tip to think about. So the deep regions, that's the deep gluteal, that's the thick fascia lata and the medial femoral fascia. So um, the deep fascia of the gluteal region, it's called the gluteal fascia, whereas the superficial is called the superficial fascia. But so if you see a, the word in gluteal fascia, you should know that that's the deep fascia. Um, and it comes from the thoracodorsal fascia, which we talked about in the presentation on latissimus dorsi. 
amazing deep fascia that where latissimus dorsi arises from. And then it, as it passes over the iliac crest, it becomes the gluteal fascia. Um, anything else I need to tell you about that? I've just got a few notes here because I didn't want to miss out anything for Lynn about fascia. Um, oh, yes, it's very thick over the middle gluteal fascia and then over the superficial fascia is quite loose. So that's really interesting. It's got different ten de tensions over different parts of the gluteal mass. Moving on to the next slide. So the middle gluteal. It, the large part of this muscle actually lies just under the fascia and the skin, so it's palpable. Um, and it's on the, um, it's covered cordially by the superficial um, gluteal. And we're going to look at my favorite story about an ice cream cone later, and that should relate that relationship between the middle and the superficial. So the middle gluteal here is represented by, it's huge, it's represented by the blue plasticine. It arises from that gluteal surface we saw on the pelvis, on the bones, which called gluteal surface. Um, and it also comes off that iliac crest that we talked about and most of the tuba sacrale. So those points we looked at first, that's where this middle gluteal comes from. Um, the middle gluteal, it's two and a half to three and a half centimeters thick. It can be seven to nine centimeters wide. It's huge, it's very significant. And its insertion is the greater trochanter of the femur. So a really very large bony landmark telling you a very important muscle attaches to that. If you've got any questions, please put them in, ask a question. Can everybody hear me okay? Do give me some feedback. Sorry, if, you, if you're finding it's not streaming well, it will be your Wi-Fi at your end. You do need really good Wi-Fi to be able to um, partake in the live event. And it's a windy night here as well. So that seems to affect my Wi-Fi. Sometimes it's a bit delayed. So now we're going to look at the deep gluteal. And for the deep gluteal, I've represented it with yellow plasticine. It's a broad fan-shaped muscle and it lays deep to the middle gluteal. So underneath that blue plasticine is the deep, it's the deepest of the three and it lays underneath the middle. It comes from the lateral surface um, of the body of the ilium bone. So where that ilium is, the gluteal ilium and the body of the ilium, it comes from the lateral surface of that area, um, quite near that ischiatic spine. And it's got a really short, thick tendon. And as it converges, the muscle fibers converge like a fan. Think of the spine of a fan, converges down as it descends, and it attaches to the cranial aspect of the greater trochanter. Okay, so you've got the middle gluteal there and the deep. So it's completely covered by the middle gluteal. However, it kind of prolongs a bit further and doesn't poke out, but it just extends a little bit further underneath the middle, and then it converges onto the cranial part of the greater trochanter. And um, it's often got a small bursa, which is really relevant clinically, so a really good tip. Deep to that tendon of insertion, it's in, in a huge percentage of dogs, there is a small bursa there as well. So I thought this would be really helpful. You can see the blue plasticine, so the middle gluteal, I'm pulling that back so you can see that the deep gluteal, the yellow deep gluteal is laying underneath it. So the picture in the top right is the green plasticine represents piriformis. Now a huge number of anatomists, they actually decide that piriformis in the dog is part of the deep gluteal, but there are some bodies of thought who figure it's a separate muscle. So I've just colored them to give you that representation. Um, and then the middle gluteal covers all of the deep, most of the piriformis, but most of that, the rest of it is covered by the superficial. So it's just to get you orientated around this. And if you're finding you're needing a little bit more time with the um, slides and to orientate yourself, just to let you know, we've downloaded the PDF of this presentation into the Canine Anatomy Hub, which I will tell you at the end of the presentation how to access that. So here we've got the deep gluteal and piriformis, and we're looking at that debate. Is it part of the deep gluteal? Is it a separate muscle? What we do know is that piriformis, it lies caudal 
and medial to the middle gluteal. So it's underneath it, it's deep to it, but it lays behind it cordally, and which you could see in the previous slide. Um, and it's covered by that superficial gluteal muscle that we're going to look at shortly in the next slide. So it arises from the lateral aspect of the third sacral vertebra, they're fused, so the lateral aspect of the third, so quite caudal on that bone, and the first caudal vertebra, that's the first bone, the vertebra of the tail. So that's where it arises from, and I'm hoping you can see that in the right-hand picture there. Um, and its insertion is with the middle gluteal, so it goes onto the greater trochanter with the middle gluteal. So here we have the superficial gluteal, which lies next to the middle gluteal. So the superficial gluteal here is kind of an orangey red. It comes from that deep gluteal fascia we were talking about. So through the glu deep gluteal fascia, it arises from the tuba sacrale. It comes from that caudal fascia. So through the caudal fascia, it's actually attached to the lateral border of the sacrum, to that first caudal vertebra and the proximal half of that sacrotuberous ligament. So that black structure that we saw on the very early slide orientating yourself, that black line, I've, I've represented that with a, a black pipe cleaner there. And you can see the proximal half of that is where the superficial gluteal muscle arises from. And what's really fascinating about this is the tendon fuses with tensor fascia lata. I'm really sorry, I've just noticed I've spelt that wrong. So it's tensor fascia lata should be L-A-T-A, -A, which is the TFL muscle. And it's the aponeurosis that covers tensor fascia lata. So we've got a real integration of muscles. Don't think of your muscles working alone or in small groups. They work in sequences to provide movement patterns, but also they have a great interplay with the fascia around the muscles and around the surrounding muscles as well. So this is a slide that we had in the quadriceps femoris um, canine bite size um, anatomy um, series in um, quadriceps femoris. And this is just a replication of that to show you that TFL laid over the quadriceps. So in the dog, quadriceps femoris is deep. It's not like in humans. If you just run your hands on your thighs, just under your skin and fascia there is your quadriceps, your main walking muscle in the dog it's deep because it has a very different role. So it's really, have, if you haven't seen the quadriceps femoris um, presentation, please have a look at that. And so TFL is really intimate with the fascia and also with the gluteals. So this is we're coming up to my favorite analogy that I want to tell you about. So TFL on the left large picture is laying over the quadriceps. And I feel if you look at that, to me, it represents an ice cream cone. So I don't want you to think about the pale beige ice cream cone that you get. I want you to think about those delicious Italian cones that kind of furl round. And we've got um, a diagram, a schematic diagram in the bottom right corner showing you where it curls around. And this is a really top clinical tip about muscle injuries on TFL. So the most common muscle injury in the pelvic limb is gracilis. That's what we see all the time. The second most common muscle injury in the pelvic limb, in the hind limb, okay, is tensor fascia lata muscle. And one of its very common places that you'll find that injury is where that line is on the cone in the middle. It's kind of like a French pleat, the muscle. TFL kind of is in parts. It folds in with its, in itself, and it's a weak link in the design. So that is where you can get a fascial tear very often. And the reason I'm telling you this is because it's so misdiagnosed, it's so missed. So don't forget TFL main action is about hip flexion. It does other things as well, but it's a mainly a hip flexor. So if you want to palpate this clinically, very mindful with therapeutic handling, you would stress test that muscle, taking it into extension while you palpate that area. And that is a top clinical tip. So log that away. It's really useful to check because it's the second most common injury on the pelvic limb. And it's so often misdiagnosed and missed. So let's get back to the gluteals where all the action is. It's, they're the power muscles. They're the huge power muscles along with our hamstrings. And we've got the middle gluteal there, which is like a blob of ice cream. One huge scoop. 
And then sometimes if you're very lucky, you get a second blob of ice cream. And that's the superficial where you kind of get like a half or two thirds of a blob merged in. So the middle gluteal is the blue blob of ice cream and the superficial is the orangey red behind it. And it's such a useful analogy because the TFL, tensor fascia lata muscle, the gluteals, they're all innervated by the gluteal nerve. So TFL is innervated by the cranial gluteal nerve. The deep and middle gluteals are innervated by the cranial gluteal nerve. And the smaller caudal gluteal nerve innervates superficial um, gluteal muscle. So I hope that helps kind of get that in your mind. It's a useful story, I think, when you're looking at the muscles to kind of really get to grips where all these components are. So my other top clinical tip, I don't know if you can see my arrow. I'm going to do it very slowly because I know we have a two to three second delay, but I'm just moving here between the superficial and the middle gluteal. If anybody can see that, please do say. I'm hoping you can see the arrowhead on there. That fascial guttering between the middle and superficial is a very common place for trigger points in in um in this muscle so it's it's a real weak link there so you need to make sure you palpate palpate that with therapeutic handling being very mindful just in case you 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 spot an active trigger point in there so it's a fascial guttering where the fascia kind of goes down into a valley so when you're looking at your fascia and you're exploring it think of hills and valleys so we've got this lovely mound of middle gluteal should be like a lovely hill and then it goes in a valley the fascial guttering with the superficial and that's a very common site in muscles for finding trigger points or issues another great clinical tip i hope it's um useful for you so let's think about these muscle actions we have got a huge powerhouse here because essentially they all extend the hip an extension of the hip especially when we're retracting. So don't forget the power sweep of movement is retraction. Protraction is the limb going forward. Retraction is the limb going backward. And when the, when the paw hits the ground in early stance to mid stance to push off, that retraction phase is the power sweep of all movement. That's what we should be concentrating on, not flexor patterns, which is what you do when you're laying where you don't want to load your leg, but to really use that small amount of retraction before it um, leaves, you've got push off and it leaves the ground. So the last bit of retraction we're not interested in, we're interested in the power sweep. So if you want to strengthen a dog, this is where we concentrate. So the middle gluteal, as well as being a main hip extensor and a retractor of the pelvic limb, it also is a medial rotator of the hip. And we're gonna explore this a bit more in the hip joint next in the next session. Um, and what it's there for is it works with the muscles of close association that support the hip joint there on the medial aspect of the pelvis. And so these two, they act like a V. So if I hold my hands up like that, they act like a V. It's all about sagittal plane movement. What they're doing is they're limiting, the middle gluteal is limiting lateral rotation, okay, when weight bearing because the muscles of close association are lateral rotators. So this is about balancing that pelvis out, which is really sitting in the sagittal plane and it is designed to move forward. So all our rehab choices should be about forward movement in the sagittal plane. Don't rush to doing complex sequences or turns or breaking. They're very complex for the dog's tissue to do and it's a lot more force. Concentrate on how the dog's biomechanically designed. There is no where anywhere in the reasoning of the biomechanics and the anatomy, I'm gonna walk a dog backwards. I am not gonna je jeopardize the biomechanical design. I am not going to put extra tension and force through the caudal cruciate ligament of the stifle. Yes, it's proprioceptively enriched, but so are so many forward motion um, activities with therapeutic handling and movement shaping and alignment techniques and your static and dynamic work. So let's get that toolbox to be really relevant for the dog and limit any damage or extra additional force you put through this structure. So the deep gluteal, as well as being the main hip extensor with the middle gluteal, there is a little bit of abduction there, which is the limb going away. Now, if you think about it, it's functional abduction. So if you stand up 
and you sit down. As you sit down, we have a little bit of movement um, in the hip joint, which is a ball and socket joint, which we're going to go through in the next session. Um, so if a dog stands up and then it sits down, we have a little bit of play where they'll actually abduct slightly. And it's for a comfortable posture, okay? So we also have a design in the dog, just to let you know, they have the most enormous adductor muscle group compared to other species. And so the abductors and adductors, again, it's about working to prevent abduction and movement. So we need it functionally for sitting and for postures, but we don't want it when we're running. So for the dog, the dog doesn't want it when they're running. So it's about maintaining that sagittal plane forward movement. All these design features are just amazing. So we've also got superficial gluteal, which again is a hip extensor, but the deep also is really important as a medial rotator with the middle to prevent lateral rotation when weight bearing. So think of that when the dog is weight bearing, when it's got its retraction sweep and it's walking, trotting, running, that's what that functions for. So piriformis, if you're thinking of it as part of the deep, is a hip extensor. And if you're thinking of it separately, it's a hip extensor. So that's the action of the gluteal muscles. So we're thinking of therapeutic handling techniques. We're thinking of movement enrichment. And this is about a two-way communication with the dog. It's mindful palpation. It's therapeutic touch and palpation. Um, it gives you accurate assessment and effective treatment techniques. It's about being mindful when you locate those bony landmarks, not rubbing them. When you find them, it's light touch work. That's definite. Less is more, firm, but gentle. Okay, a definite touch, but it's very light. You will be able to then palpate the deeper structures without the dog moving or wanting to sit down. So that's a really top clinical tip. If you are palpating the bony landmarks and the gluteals and the dog tries to sit down, your palpation is too purposeful and it's a little bit too much for the dog to cope with. So light, but definite. And we always respond to the dog's feedback signals. So if they're giving off signals, be respectful of that and work with the dog. It's not just working with the dogs um, um, overall, but it's also working with the tissue. So you're finding a compliance of the tissue and you're making a connection and it's, it's mindful, it's effective, and you get the most amazing results if you work like this with dogs. So again, just showing you here, um, referencing the skeleton where you've got your thumbs just resting on the tuber sacrali. Um, and you're comparing left to right. We're going to go through a lot more of examining all the different landmarks in the hip joint presentation in two weeks' time. And again, you're replicating that where I've got a definite but light touch on the tuber sacrali in the left-hand picture. I'm watching the dog. I'm getting my alignment. It's, it's with thought but not purposeful hands. My hands are just a tool to apply that sensitive and definite but light palpation technique. So any questions? We've got a couple of questions, so I'm gonna dive into there. Um, after the questions, if you've got the information you want, absolutely fine to sign out, um, leave us some feedback. If you want to know more about that canine anatomy hub that we've been developing even more this week, do stay tuned and I'll tell you about that and about our next session. But that's, I've covered everything on the gluteals now, so I'm just going to come down to the questions. We've got three questions suddenly. So if you can stop the upvoting, because we've got some voting. So as I stamp, I'm going to time stamp the questions. So you don't have to watch the whole presentation again. You can just go to the question and listen to that. So it's a really neat feature of Crowdcast. So I'm just going to start answering. And it's Bernadette's question from France. Bonsoir, Bernadette. And she's asking, in an older dog, how important are the gluteals to functionality, day-to-day -day necess necessities? This is a brilliant question, okay? So we're going to be um, really exploring the elderly dog as well very soon. I've got some really exciting news about that. In the older dog, in the more mature dog, your muscle tone changes and you've got general aging. The gluteals along with the hamstrings are vital for powering for the dog when they're any age, particularly when they're older. As long as you've got the core activated and you've got your epaxial muscles. So a lot of people concentrate on the gluteals and they've missed the main act, which is the core. So activating the epaxials, which are your main stabilizers, 
to transmit the power that's transmitted through the moment arm from the gluteal and hamstrings forward through the spine. Think of it as a drive shaft in your car to move the dog forward. So incredibly important. It's a great question, Bernadette. And another really top clinical tip. OK, the gluteals do not have a sensory supply. OK, so in their innovation, which we go into a little bit more in the anatomy hub, they don't have a sensory supply. They just have a motor supply. So hear this, all therapists. There's no point doing sensory work on the gluteals because they won't activate. You actually have to get the motor unit recruitment. You have to activate them. And it's not by doing a rhythmical stabilization. You need to capture that moment before that as the muscle recruits and switches on with its motor unit recruitment. And if you want to know more about that, email us, let us know, and we can do something about that as well, because that's really exciting. Thanks for a great question, Bernadette. So I've got another one here from Kat. If you can just stop the upvoting for a moment. I've just time stamped it. So Kat, thank you for your question. It says, can you recommend exercises to trigger gluteals? Well, it's not so much triggering them because we don't want any kind of reflexive response. We want to recruit them. We want that motor unit recruitment. And, and, and if you want to know a little bit more about what we're evolving over these next few months, stay on after the questions to the last few slides and I'll go through what, what we're interested in doing. But it's really going to be depending on your responses and your feedback to us. So... Some non-weight bearing as well, if possible. Hydro currently not available, but you can do lots of things, weight bearing and non-weight bearing, but really to activate your power muscles, you have to think about forces rather than weight bearing. So there's lots of ways to do that and they're really exciting and it's about working with the dog using therapeutic handling and movement enrichment techniques, which I'm, I'm really excited to share with you. I hope, Kat, that's enough of you, um, a, an answer for you. I, I hope that kind of helped. So I've got another question here. They're coming in. If you've got any more questions, please do ask. Again, just please don't um, upvote for the moment. Oops, somebody's upvoted. So what's happened? I've just lost that question. Hang on, I'll just go to, so it's a question from Mel Matthews. Hello, Mel, good evening. So, um, Hi, Barb. Where do the nerves run between piriformis and glutes in the dog? That's such an interesting one because actually you've got to think about which gluteal nerve. So what we do know is that the caudal gluteal nerve actually runs along the medial aspect of the um, ischial body, along the medial of the ilial body, sorry, of the ilium, the body of the ilium on the medial aspect. And then it passes down and it actually passes between piriformis and superficial glute. And I've got a lot more about the innovation of the um, gluteals for you with a bit more detail in the Canine Anatomy Hub, Mel. So that might be interesting for you to check out. Um, and I hope that helps. And we've got one last question here from Kat again. Hello, Kat. Can you go through the impact of cruciate injury on the gluteals? Not in this presentation. That's something we're going to discuss when we go through the stifle joint, which is a real biggie. I might have to put stifle joint over two sessions because it's huge. And this is like a bite size, half an hour, and I'm already running over. But um, anything that's affecting the limb, the pelvic limb in any way is going to impact the whole sequence of muscles, not just the muscles affected around the joint, because movement is arranged in sequences and it's orchestrated, commanded by the proprioceptive system. So don't look at movement on a joint level, look at it as a sequence, uh, a really good tip. Thank you, Kat, great answer. Oh, sorry, I just got distracted, I was watching the, the, the chat. Right, let's go through there. So if you've got everything you want about the gluteals, do sign off. Um, we've just got a couple more slides. I want to talk to people who are interested with working with the dog, finding out a bit more about the Canine Anatomy Hub. So if you've got your information, absolutely sign out and just give us some feedback. Um, and I'm just going to go back on my slides to tell you about the next presentation and just bring up the button. So you do, do, do need to see this. Now it's live. Hopefully you can see that. Underneath the presentation, you should see a green button that says Bite Size Canine Anatomy Hub. Please do let me know if you can see it. 
So the next one we've released literally a few minutes before this presentation is on the canine hip joint. It's going to be on the 3rd of May at 7 p.m. I do hope that you're able to join us. We've had so many emails about people saying they haven't been able to access the Canine Anatomy Hub. This is a new resource we've added in for you. If you click the green button, that takes you straight to the Notion page. And the Notion page is amazing. It's like a Harry Potter page. So it's a page that we're building into a library for you. And we're adding to all the different individual presentations. So if you want to access the PDF, from this presentation or any of the other bite-sized canine anatomy, they're in there, along with the replays of the presentation and lots more pictures that you haven't seen and also some information, a bit more depth of information. Now, if you want to um, access the bite-sized canine anatomy hub, use this link, but it's also under our YouTube. So if you go onto YouTube, Canine HS, all our presentations are on there and we've also got the link if you go to see more underneath the presentation underneath the video of youtube there's a link there they're all live they take you straight to that page if you want to use our canine anatomy hub we've produced it for free along with all these presentations and we're trying really hard to keep going and producing one every fortnight it does take quite a few days believe it or not it takes two to three days to produce this presentation so if you would like us to continue, we would so appreciate and invite you to buy us a coffee. And a lot of people have asked me over the week, what's buy us a coffee? I don't understand. All it is is a link that if you feel that you've got some value and worth out of this presentation, if you feel the Anatomy Hub offers you something useful, if you would like to buy us a coffee, it's three pounds. You can buy us a couple of coffees if you want. We're putting all our coffee money towards being able to keep producing these at this rate. Um, so, you know, please think about buying us a coffee. We're using this for you to bring back more information to you. So that's our presentation over for this time. It's been fantastic. Please give us some feedback in the chat if you found this useful. It's really humbling and brilliant. We cannot tell you how grateful we are that you come from all over the world to sign in and it's just brilliant sharing information with people who share our passion for working with the dog, using techniques, working cohesively with the dog's consent rather than applying a technique on a dog. It's just the most fantastic work and I'm just so grateful for the dogs in my life and thank you so much for attending the live event. I'll say bye for now.